Shalom everyone, dear distinguished guests. Good afternoon and thank you all for joining us worldwide for this side event at the 64th UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs titled Community First, a Holistic Approach to Mental Health and Substance Abuse Amid COVID-19. Today our panel will highlight the intersection of mental health and substance abuse and the need for more collaborative services that address people's needs. My name is Liron David. I'm the Policy and International Relations Chief Officer at ENOSH, the Israeli Mental Health Association, a nonprofit organization that provides community-based mental health services and promotes the rights of people with psychosocial disabilities and their family members. We are honored to lead this event together with LM Youth in Distress, a nonprofit dedicated to treating and transforming the lives of troubled youth in Israel. Both organizations see the need to address mental health issues and addiction implications among adults and youth. We would like to share with you today the innovative and bold Israeli approach. We are grateful to our co-organizers, the Israeli Permanent Mission to the UN in Vienna, the World Health Organization, the Israeli Ministry of Health, and our friends in the United States, Jewish Child and Family Services in Chicago, and the Youth Advocate Program, Inc. in Washington, DC. Each speaker in the panel will address different aspects, data, and best practices. Since we are on a very tight schedule, I will present our speakers during the webinar. And if you wish, you can read more about them in our website. You can send questions to speakers through the Q&A box, and we will try very hard to answer them during the event. I'm honored to invite three great women to make opening remarks. First, I want to welcome Ms. Sylvia Berladsky Baruch, Deputy Permanent Representative to the UN and other international organizations in the Permanent Mission of Israel, Vienna. Sylvia, please open the camera. Dear participants, it's a great honor to participate in this CND side event, and I thank the Israeli and American NGOs and the international partners who have teamed, teamed up to address this important and timely topic, since COVID-19 has exacerbated many problems associated with both mental health and substance use. Israel is known for its innovation in many aspects of life and develops unique services for people with disabilities. I hope we will have all a fruitful and interesting discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Sylvia. I am honored to welcome Ms. Ms. Hila Hadass, Dr. Hila Hadass, the CEO of Enosh, for her opening remarks. Dear guests, thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Liron. I'm honored to be here. As the CEO of Enosh for the past 13 years, I have witnessed tremendous changes in mental health field that I can attribute to both the importance of an inclusive and holistic approach and to a significant change regarding stigma. This major change combined with person-centered methodology led us to develop services to meet the needs of vulnerable groups, such as youth, women who experience abuse, the elderly, and people who face addiction and homelessness, a group that is at the center of this event. COVID-19 was a catalyst for changes on global and local levels. Today, it's clear that mental health is everyone's story. Society at large learn how important it is to allocate resources and effort to mental health. I am grateful for this cross-sectoral collaboration that will bring new insights to accelerate innovative solutions in mental health. Thank you, Hila. I am now honored to welcome Ms. Nava Barak, the president of LM Youth in Distress for her opening remarks. Thank you, Liron. It's a pleasure to be here today. I would like to thank the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs for providing this important platform. This conference is a unique opportunity for nonprofit organizations from all over the world to learn from each other about the impact of narcotics on our communities and our vulnerable populations. We at LM are honored to be included. 
would also like to thank my partner and Notion Isra Mission to you and in Vienna. There is no doubt that we have brought together a panel to address a very important issue. And Milton Distress is digital author's largest organization addressing the problems of at risk youth. And this is working and being with vulnerable young people for more than 35 years, supporting hundreds of thousands of teens. With 80 programs nationwide, we see the entire spectrum of risk, including school attrition, social anxiety, substance abuse, domestic violence, and sexual exploitation. As the need escalated during the coronavirus outbreak in Israel, so did requests for help from Ellen. We saw 30% more teens at our drop-in centers and 31% uh, more distress online. Despite three lockdowns, our outreach van met many more young people on the streets. Ellen volunteering staff met teens struggling with depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and self-harm. More and more young people turn to alcohol and drugs, either to alleviate the boredom of life under lockdown or to mitigate the pain of the situations. Ellen continues presence in the neighborhood and community throughout the outbreak, ensured that the system was accessible to at risk teens. I'm really privileged to take part in this vital discussion of the juncture between mental health issues and mind altering substances among our most vulnerable population. Thank you all. Thank you, Nava. I think your sound was a bit uh, tricky. Um, maybe we will have time later to, to hear you again with the first section of your opening remarks. So I will, I will address that uh, later on in this event. Um, I am now honored uh, to tell you about the global pandemic in the past year that was a major catalyst for the global mental health movement. Uh, people discuss that, understand that, and the international community sees mental health as a priority. Um, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Fami Hanna from the World Health Organization Mental Health and Substance Abuse Department to provide some global insight. Iron, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a pleasure and honor to join you today. And thanks very much for Enos leadership on including this important topic on the CND agenda. Uh, can, um, would, you, would you share my slides, please? Yeah, we can see your uh, slides. Perfect, thank you. Uh, would you move to the next slide, please? Perfect, thank you. Colleagues, COVID-19 has exposed the troubling situation of community-based mental health services globally. These services, even before COVID-19, were exactly like this person, carrying a heavy burden, moving directly uphill, with less than 2% of, uh, uh, of countries' financial expenditure on health is being spent on mental, on mental health globally. Now, COVID has entered the picture with significant and considerable direct and indirect effects on mental health. First, adversity. Adversity, a risk factor for short-term and long-term mental health problem, and adversity come with the economic burden of COVID-19 that we see in many, in many countries. COVID-19 infection itself come with direct mental and neurological manifestation. COVID-19 also led indirectly to widespread fear and anxiety and worried, also linked to stigma globally. Let's move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Between June and August last year, WHO have disseminated a survey that received responses from 130 member states. We found that there were significant impact on mental, neurological, and substance use services during the COVID-19 pandemic last year. 93% of countries reported that at least one of their essential mental, neurological, or substance use services has been disrupted. Three over four of school mental health services disrupted more than 50% of over, overdose treatment facilities has been, has been disrupted globally. Let's move to the next slide, please. 80 
nine percent of uh, of countries has reported that uh, mental health and psychosocial support is part of their COVID response plan, which is excellent news. Two over uh, over three of the countries reported that they have multi-sectoral mental health and psychosocial support coordination platforms. But the bad news is that only 17% of the countries globally reported that they have allocated full funding to implement their mental health and psychosocial plans, which is part of the COVID-19 response. So still limited resources are allocated for community-based mental health and psychosocial support during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. At global and policy level, mental health and psychosocial support come as a as a priority topic. WHO recognizes it as an integral component of COVID-19 response from the United Nations. Uh, there was a Secretary General policy brief released on the topic last year. For the first time as part of the Global Humanitarian Response Plan, which led by OCHA, we see mental health and psychosocial support coming as a cross-cutting topic. WHO reported mental health and psychosocial support as part of the essential service continuation packages and also WHO governing bodies, the executive board have discussed and the World Health Assembly is also discussing mental health and psychosocial support as part of COVID-19 preparedness and response. There is a joint inter-agency call for actions from heads of agency uh, of different, uh, of wide range of UN organization has been released also last year. Next, please. Thank you. Emerging evidence, colleagues, suggests that elevated risks of acquiring COVID-19 and experiencing worse outcome among people with substance use disorders. Unfortunately, what's obvious and worrisome is that many services were disrupted. Some of these services can be life-threatening, such as opioid agonist maintenance treatments. In response, countries have implemented different approaches to adjust policy responses to psychoactive substances. However, we need time to understand better the changes and pattern in consumption of drugs and alcohol during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's likely that we may see different patterns across substance and across countries. However, preliminary data suggests increased level of online gaming and gambling during the lockdown and confinement. Next slide, please. Again, an emerging topic which we start to learn more about is the post-COVID syndrome. However, we need time to understand better the changes and patterns in consumption of drug and alcohol. It's uh, in among this group, but it, it, can, it can be one of the negative coping mechanisms in response to depression and anxiety, particularly in this group of patients with long-term symptoms of COVID. Next, please. We have been developing wide range of tools for different age groups. One of the tools you see here is the children's story book, which is available now in more than 140 languages. And thanks to a good collaboration early in the response we had with Inush, it's available in Hebrew as well. But there are also uh, resources recently released for older adults mental health, step by step for adolescent mental health care, doing what matters an illustrated self guide for dealing with, with, with stress. Also a guide uh, for on basic psychosocial skills for COVID-19 responders. Most of these resources are available in many languages. As I said, some are available in 100 plus, some are available in 40 plus languages and in multiple formats, including also accessible formats. Next, please. So the way forward, which is in line with the recommendations in the executive board of WHO decision on mental health and psychosocial support, and also in line with the UN Secretary General policy brief recommendation, first is that countries need to allocate human and financial resources for scaling up mental health and psychosocial support as part of every services, applying a whole of government approach. Second, countries need to maintain essential mental, neurological and substance use services during and following COVID-19 pandemic to use it as an opportunity for building back better services in these areas. Third is to strengthen the monitoring mechanisms for any changes in mental, neurological and substance use services. Thank you. Thank you, Fami. Very important work in a very difficult year. As we move forward um, from the global perspective to the local country level, I'm delighted to present Dr. Paula Oshka, Head of Department for Treatment of Substance Abuse in the Israeli Ministry of Health. Hello, Paula. Hello to everybody. I'm very honored to be here and to share with you our thoughts. Um, I would say that since the 2010, the Ministry of Health, the Department for the Treatment of Substance Abuse, and 
uh, the mental health division have been committed to promote evidence-based holistic and integrated prevention and treatment approaches in the community for people who use drugs and dual diagnosis patients. Uh, since the mental health reform implementation, both in inpatient and outpatient treatment, is provided by the four HMOs and the ministry act as a regulator only, while the medical treatment for substance use disorder remained under the responsibility of the Ministry of Health and the psychosocial approach of rehabilitation under the Ministry of Welfare, thus creating a need for increased coordination between ministries and organizations. The law for the rehabilitation of mental patients is issued in 2000 greatly progressed the reintegration both of mental and dual diagnosis patients in the community, implementing approaches such as ITT, trauma-informed treatment, motivational and enhancement, DBT, and 12 steps approaches. The rate of ac acceptance of mental patients to the uh, rehabilitation basket was uh, assessed and we found that around 90% of patients do uh, receive this uh, approach. And uh, about 85% of, of dual diagnosis patients have the, the right to get this uh, um, uh, rehabilitation. During COVID-19, we have been facing challenges in order to maintain continuity of care, despite the mitigation measures in line with the WHO and UNODC guidelines. About 40% of severe mental inpatients also use drugs, and even more so in the community. And during the last decade, more treatment and rehabilitation services have been opened in the community, addressing more complex populations. Uh, during COVID-19, we increased our interministerial cooperation, the cooperation with NGOs in the community, expanding a multi-sectorial response. The pandemic forced us to develop more accessible accelerated service provision using digital health solutions and remote services. We showed effectiveness and will therefore be used even in the future, among them also take home opioid substitution medications for longer periods, such as methadone or suboxone. Mental health comorbidity appeared to be even more frequent during the pandemic due to increased anxiety, isolation, loneliness, and increased alcohol and substance use. We expect increased morbidity during the next years, and there is a strong need for resource allocations, and we are preparing ourselves for this increased demand. Due to changes in the drug market with more NPS uh, use and uh, non-medical opioid medication use, housing problems, poverty, lack of food, the demand for detox beds increased, especially for the homeless, for sex workers and women, and additional specific services were therefore promptly opened. We witnessed increased demand for dual diagnosis detox, and unfortunately, the detox facility, being a mental health department, was transformed into a coronavirus department for mental patients, and we faced great problems in providing this kind of services. So we learned the lesson, and we are now uh, organizing uh, different services for in, in every event. The issue prompted us to develop additional services for detox, in, uh, for dual diagnosis, also for the youth. Specific complex populations became now the focus of our interventions. We therefore plan to implement rehabilitation and treatment approaches based on IMR and assertive community treatment for complex diagnosis patients. Other important approaches that need to be implemented in the rehabilitation services is in the community include housing first, hostels and protected housing for dual diagnosis patients actively using drugs, thus implementing harm reduction approaches. The last challenge is to work in cooperation with community NGOs and other relevant ministries to address the specific mental health and substance use problems of the youth who have been particularly affected by the pandemic and need therefore special support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. Um, and now for uh, the, our panel of services, I'm happy to call our panelists, Ms. Hilabo Chan, Director of Substance Abuse and Rehabilitation Services at ENOSH, 
Ms. Nina Henry, an addiction specialist and mental health educator at the Jewish Child and Family Services in Chicago, and Mr. Roy Homri, National Director, LM's Outreach Van Program. Please open your cameras so we can discuss uh, the first question that I have for you, and it's about uh, COVID-19 and community. Uh, in light of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, if you can please share with us how your organization's programs supported people and youth who are facing mental health and substance abuse. We will start with uh, Hila. Thank you, Liron, for the question. Very excited to be here. Well, I'm going to give you the short answer first, and that's phones and routines. And I'll come back to that later, but first I want to tell you a little bit about our programs for people that cope with mental health and substance abuse. As we heard here, many of the people with psychosocial disability are using narcotic drugs or alcohol. And we're also aware that those problems are somehow connected. Mental health can lead to substance use and substance use can lead to mental health. And no matter what comes first, both issues should be addressed. And although we know all that, there are a few services available in Israel that treat both issues. So a few years ago, Enosh started developing a recovery program for people who cope with mental health and addiction through a supportive housing setting. What was innovative about the program was that both problems got treatment under the same roof. Our teams included professional case managers and recovering addict uh, counselors, which were supporting the members recovery program. And we had two requirements for the people that got in the program. First, they had to avoid using drugs or alcohol. And second, they had to participate in a daily activity to keep a routine framework. We had four group homes in four cities and more than 20 members. And that program went very well for the people that got in the program. But what about those who couldn't? After a while, we realized that a lot of the people who cope with mental health and substance abuse can't keep a job for so long, and they sure can't commit to stop using, so sadly, they couldn't get in the program. Well, then we started developing a unique individual program that had only one requirement, keep in touch with us. In this program, we reached out to the people and made the connection at first without demanding anything and we let the members choose what their program will include according to their needs. So after making the connection and gaining the members' trust, we offer them all kinds of support from our organization or from the community. So we offer them connecting to psychiatrists from the, from the addiction field and supporting going to AA or an A meeting together with a sponsor and supporting signing up to rehab clinics or monitoring them through drug tests and helping creating a meaningful daily routine. And that's just to name a few. Today, we have more than a hundred members in that program. So when COVID-19 started spreading, we were worried our system was at risk and we knew we had to keep the connection and the routine alive. The first things we did is to make sure the two tasks are getting done. We work together with our members on a new schedule and a new daily routine. But the problem was some of our members didn't have the financial means for smartphones, Wi-Fi or data. So we found it very hard to keep in touch with them through remote platforms. Lots of hard work had paid off as we received a very generous donation of smartphones, which we gave to the, the to the members so we could keep the connection going through video chats and WhatsApp messaging. And when we felt we needed to see the members in person, we sent a staff member to meet them outdoors according to the government guidelines. So this is how phones and routines helped us keep the program going when the pandemic started. To conclude, throughout the last year and to our surprise, only a few members had setbacks. We realized that the tools they gained through the recovery program in Anosh worked as a prevention program that helped them cope with the global crisis. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ila. Nina? Hello, everyone. Shalom. I am honored and delighted to be with all of you today. Um, I'm speaking uh, as a representative of Jewish Child and Family Services, JCFS Chicago. And um, I want to say briefly that JCFS Chicago is an organization that's been in the community for 160 years. And this, of course, enabled us to really have very deep roots in our community, allowed us to really um, have a grasp of what's going on on the ground. So when we, when the pandemic started, we jumped into action right away. We really um, began to reach out to our various constituencies, and this included reaching out to rabbis in the greater Chicago area, our professional partners, Jewish day schools, and others to find out what were they experiencing on the ground. And what we heard as many of you working in your various communities are probably hearing as well that during the pandemic, people felt grief stricken, of course, due to loss of people due to COVID, but also grief because they were so isolated from all the things that they knew and all the things that they've been doing. They felt anxious and stressed, what's tomorrow gonna bring? So hearing all of this, our team at the Community Services Department of JCFS put together something called evenings of support. So these are community-wide gatherings that provide wisdom and support through a Jewish lens. They are large or small online group gatherings that offer the opportunity for parents, educators, and other frontline workers and adults of all ages and life stages to discuss the challenges that were brought about by the pandemic. We've offered probably in the realm of about a dozen of these programs, usually held in the evening, and I just wanna share a little bit about what the programs were and what, how they were set up. Uh, just some examples, each evening of support really addressed something different. So one evening uh, of support addressed grief during, you know, grief due to loss during the pandemic. Uh, we had an evening of support for people in recovery. As so many people in recovery felt so isolated, they you know, found it difficult to do these online 12-step groups and so forth, and also evenings of support for parents grappling with, you know, children being at home, trying to work at the same time. So we really thought we needed to meet those needs. So what did these programs consist of? Usually we would start with some music, like a nigun or a chant, a, you know, sort of repetitive music to sort of get people into the mood. And then we would maybe have a, a rabbi or a Jewish educator, educator would introduce a Jewish thought or an idea or a topic, a Torah reading. And, uh, and then we also, uh, after that, would have someone, usually, usually a clinician or someone experienced with educating about grief and loss, and they would provide some uh, didactic information, if you will. And then we would always have someone with lived experience, because we know from research that someone ex expressing their lived experience of grief or depression or loss, this is the greatest way to break stigma against these problems. And we also uh, would then have some sort of a ritual to close the program. So for instance, for the grief during loss uh, during the pandemic, we had all of the participants bring with them a photograph. And of course we use the squares of Zoom so they would display the photograph of their loved one and would light a candle. And again, we would have music during that moment. And then we also offered meditation and just quiet thoughtfulness. So that was what those evenings of support uh, consisted of. And uh, we, as I said, we had probably about a dozen and they were highly successful. Another thing that we did is people just needed to connect. So we developed a couple of support groups free of charge and invited people to drop in, if you will, to these groups. Um, and it, we didn't necessarily limit the group to any particular age or, or any kind of um, demographic, but we found, at least for the group that I facilitate, that most of the participants were older adult women. So most of the women in my group are older adults from 55 and up. And we talked about, again, grief, loss, isolation, but also coping strategies. What are you doing to cope with this? Are you going out and taking a walk? What are you doing to cope with the day-to-day -day stressors of being isolated and indoors and away from your loved ones? And uh, really, we've talked about a wide range of issues. 
Um, and one other thing I just want to share with you is that for older adults, we uh, collaborate with many of our sister agencies in the area who specialize in serving the older adult community. And certainly the Time to Talk groups definitely met that need. Uh, professional trainings uh, revolved around uh, helping other professionals identify who's isolated, what's going on in their lives, how can we help them cope with this. this. And uh, we also offer uh, programs like something called Empower, um, just to help older adults to more safely use their medications. And this is something that's done again through the auspices of synagogues or uh, organizations that specialize in offering services to older adults. So that's what we're doing at uh, JCFS Chicago. Thank you, Nina. Uh, Roy, now you, and I want uh, to highlight something that Nava said that struck me that 30% more teens um, were coming to your drop-in centers and 41% uh, more online distress. Uh, but yeah, it's your platform. Thank you for, for the opening, Liron. And yes, indeed, this was just part of what we saw during the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to expand about our way of work and how it helped us to identify those kind of phenomena and uh, give service for teenagers and young adults. So Ellen runs a broad uh, range of projects designed to help at-risk young people. Uh, we strive to get in touch to, with them and identify vulnerable teenagers and young adults at the early stages of risk, not, and not only when they face acute risk. Uh, we do so by activating projects, a very uh, large variety of projects within the community itself uh, that works throughout the daytime and the nighttime. We have projects that work in schools, we have drop-in centers for youth, and we also activate outreach teams that go out in the night times to the neighborhood, the parks, parking lot, and whatnot. And obviously, uh, to support all that, we do a lot of social media work uh, with social networks and online work in order to get in touch with teenagers and young adults who suffer or deal with distress situations. Uh, in a way, LM seeks to be where they are and when they are. Um, the teenagers that we work with uh, deals with uh, emotional distress, which are beyond the standard of uh, ordinary adolescent. Uh, they deal with anxiety, with depression, and PTSD based on sexual assault or some even on the security level here in Israel, as some of you might know. Uh, that causes PTSD along uh, teenagers. Um, mostly, uh, we see them do more substantial, sorry, uh, doing a substantial uh, use of drugs uh, beyond what characterized the uh, adolescents on a normal way. Uh, by identifying those teens early, and uh, the one who chooses the use of drug in order to deal with the mental health challenges, as well as those that, due to the use of drugs, deal with psychosis and other psychological disorder, uh, we are able to help them to get help before the situations become severe. By acknowledging the problem and by offering different solutions inside or outside the community, and by helping them to find the motivation for a change, we are actually able to help them to rebuild. Uh, working within the community actually helps us in a large variety of ways, but if I to point the top three uh, things it helps us, it helps us to identify and address problems early. It helps us also to leverage the community resources to support the teen or young adults, and it also increases the chances that the young person would stay in the community or reignite into the community later on. All those, all those advantages were even more significant during the COVID while uh, people were forced to be locked down at their home. Uh, social distancing and isolation uh, created a very uh, large difficulty to identify 
uh, those population. In Israel, public social services and most of nonprofits were shut down. Some are still are. And due to our extend uh, uh, lay of projects within the community and the uh, unique ties that we have with the community, we were able to keep in touch with those young adults and teenagers, even though they were forced to be locked down at their home. When you think of it, it's a bit tragic that for most of those teens, home is where the initial distress started. Is well, for most of us, home was safe. For them, home is the least safe environment. And they were forced to be there and they didn't have anywhere else to go. So us being open and activated created a kind of a shelter within the street or the day centers. Uh, many vulnerable teens uh, did not have a place to go. So we were the first and sometimes the only uh, solution provided to them. We saw during the time that depression and anxiety more than four times than we saw before COVID. We saw twice as many teens told us that they were extremely lonely. We saw eating disorder and self-harm doubled over the course of the pandemic. While all this was going on, we were hearing about alcohol and drug use that simply tripled. And if I was to quote one of the teenagers that came into the drop-in center, he said that suddenly you are told not to go out of the house. You get depressed. I was looking for thrills, something to break the daily routine. I smoked drugs on a daily base, falling even farther until I lost myself. Fortunately, when I found out that the Ellen Drop-In Center was open, even during the lockdown, I could co come here and talk to you. Uh, this community-based service helped Ellen identify problem at an early stage and helped the teenagers to path the way for, uh, for services and to get help. It's also helped us to put pressure on the government and on the local municipalities to reopen services that were much needed because we were the only one at the field. We were the only one to say what is going on in the field. So we were able to, uh, what? Okay. <laughs> um, so, so I will wrap at this point that Adam staff and volunteers conduct outreach online and on the surface, and it helped us to get the better prisma of what was going on and help the teenagers. Sorry for taking time. Thank you, Roy. And uh, I think the perspective of youth is very important. And um, I'm, I will ask now Diana Mattison, uh, Director of International Programs and Development, and Nicholas Rosenblum, Advocate from Youth Advocate Program Inc., that will share uh, with us the youth perspective, also as you, Roy, told us, um, through a personal testimony. So if you can uh, get off the camera and Diana and Nicholas will present us the, the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings from Washington, DC. I'm Diana Madison. I'm the Director of International Development at Youth Advocate Programs, a community-based direct service and advocacy organization based here in the United States with programs in 29 states, the District of Columbia, and internationally in Ireland, Sierra Leone, Australia and Guatemala. Since 1975 at Youth Advocate Programs or YAP for short, we've used our holistic wraparound advocate model to work in partnership with youth and families with complex needs, giving them voice and choice to strengthen communities, families and individual biographies. From behavioral health, child welfare, justice, developmental disabilities, and violence interruption programs to substance use services. We found that our community-based, flexible, and strength-based 24-7 model has been well-suited to meet the needs of youth and families during the unique circumstances and stresses of the past year as we navigate the health, economic, and mental health effects of a global pandemic. Our frontline workers, whom we call advocates, have been key to the continued delivery and effectiveness of services. Recruited from the same communities where our youth and families live, these frontline workers have been integral in addressing the increased mental health needs and substance use as our youth and families cope with the pandemic. 
It's my pleasure to introduce one of our advocates, Nick Rosenblum, to share the story of Daniel and what YAP looks like in New York State. And then later on, I believe you have yeah, the video. Now a screen, we, we okay. need to show you a movie, and I think it's the technical issue. Okay, thank you. Before we okay. Got up was not good at all. Basically, I wasn't doing anything I was supposed to. Um, wasn't going to school. Just, yeah, bad stuff. My experience with you was that basically I just had too much free time on my hands okay. and you took that up to gotcha. allow me just to do good things. Gotcha, gotcha. And with probation and CIS, all they were was just like checkups. Gotcha. And we didn't like do nothing like that. Well, with CIS, I went somewhere. I can't remember. Gotcha. What, what were some of your um best memories working with me? We've had a few. Uh, <clears throat> probably the aircraft museum. Mm -hmm. yeah, Wings of Eagles. Yeah. Sweet. Right. Uh, when we started the YAP program, Daniel was hanging out with the wrong crowd, um, skipping school, doing whatever he wanted. Um, he was getting involved in drugs and alcohol. Um, and we ended up meeting with Nick and working with him in the YAP program, and they had a positive experience. Um, we had a baby. Mm. Um, so that has kind of taken up a little bit of his free time, but we were pointed in the right direction, being a single teen dad to uh, know about the resources and we might not have without the YAP program for that. My plans for the future would be to finish BOCES and- Finish up high school? Finish up high school, yeah. And become a welder, hopefully. Yeah. Then stick with that yeah. for a while. Yeah. Then, yeah. My son. My name is Nicholas Rosenblum. The past 15 months has bore its unique hardships and tragedies. I am cognizant of this daily, being true for the youth and families that I have committed this aspect of my life to serving with the youth advocate programs. Being that risk, they and or their families often struggle beyond the day-to-day -day hustle and standard impediments of adolescents such as fitting in. There are often challenges at home and displacement. This is also compacted by mental health concerns, often an antecedent to substance use and use disorders. To compound all of this with the added burdens and evisceration of routine through reactive school and community closures, familial and personal economic uncertainty, illness and unfortunately death, and often maladaptation as a result of psychosocial emotional obstacles. We have the privilege of helping others especially during this crisis of uncertainty. By utilizing the wraparound model and focusing on our family's viewpoints, on their personal needs and goals, along with regular family team assessments. The intention of finding community strengthening alternatives to incarceration and alternative placements. We explore interests through youth guided activities interwoven with strength-based goal-oriented SMART objectives and having fun along the way, pivoting to, during this crisis to smart one-to-one -one interaction. Our strength in leveraging our community and identifying or curating supports, such as my spotlighted youth, fierce advocates, and his mother and grandmother. We aim to provide advocacy, counseling, and mentorship. Our roles are only effective with consistency, the building and sustainment of strong rapport with our youth and their families, in harm reduction, we strive to end mental health stigma and the stigma of needing help through the institution of collaboration between our youth and communities. 24 seven, we are uniquely positioned as community members helping community members through our immensely important no reject, no reject policy. We do for, do with, and for every goal we cheer on. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas and Diana. And uh, for the last uh, 
question to the panel. I am inviting all the panelists to open the cameras and I want you to, um, to I want to ask you and you have a very short time to answer. How do you see the role of the community in advancing change in the area of substance abuse and mental health? We will start with uh, you, Nina. Okay, joke. So, um, as many of us have learned from uh, the success of programs like Mental Health First Aid, stigma can only be erased by increasing non-professionals' understanding of how to identify signs and symptoms of mental health, and once recognized, what they, you know, what to do. How do I address this? So, additionally, we know that research proves, and I said this earlier that hearing from someone with lived experience is the surest way to reduce stigma. And one training we've offered at JCFS Chicago comes from an organization called Faces and Voices of Recovery. This is a nationwide organization based in DC that developed a program to teach people in recovery how to speak about their recovery, particularly to government entities in the position to fund treatment and create programs. So really teaching people to be, you know, really comfortable within themselves and to reach out to their community constituencies and say, you know, this recovery works, treatment works, and look at my life. It's so great today. So let's get more of this going, more opportunities, more support. Thank you. Oi. Well, I think that uh, we all talked about different aspects of community. And I think that the, we activated uh, thousands of volunteers throughout the years from the community. The more the community will be involved within the treatment, within the identification, sorry, uh, and with, within the, the taking care to the community, to the people from the community, whether there are youth or elderies, or just uh, individuals, families, the more the involvement of the community, the less stigma, the, the, fastest we, the faster we will uh, see the problem and we'll be able to address it and take care of it. So the more ways that we will find to engage the community within the identification and the solution, uh, the better will be for everyone. Thank you. Uh, representatives from IAP. Yeah, so it's kind of to echo my colleagues here. Um, we need to work together. Um, I, if anything, over the last 15 months, as I mentioned in the video, COVID-19 has shown us the power of working communally to address the problem. Um, I think mental health and substance use disorders are no different. Um, we can better work communally and um, strengthen the um, underlying issues um, and aim to address them um, through collaboration. Thank you. Hila. Well, I think that when we're talking about mental health and substance abuse, we are actually talking about a lot more than just dual diagnosis. We are also talking about high risk for other problems like health, financial, legal, housing, and I can go on and on. But what we learned is that in order to give a holistic solution to a person with that many issues, Enosh must collaborate with other services in the community. We keep in mind that our main purpose is that over time, our members will not need us and they would be able to live an independent life while using those services on their own. There is a saying in the AA program that I like to use with our members, but I think it's a good message for the professional teams as well. And they say, only you can do it, but you can't do it alone. And I think that is what a community-based service actually means. It's hard to do it by ourselves, but together we can. Such a powerful message. Um, so unfortunately, we have to close the event very, very soon. And we, we need to do like number two and three and four sessions for this interesting and important subject. And I want to thank the participants uh, that were coming from all around the world. Uh, I want to thank the attendees here. And I want to thank the people behind the scenes, Mr. Moshe Adiri, and Rachel Yantunde Kasonga, thank you for the technical support. 
to Natasha Dornberg from LM Youth in Distress, and to the media teams at Enosh and LM. I hope to see you all at our future events, and please follow us uh, on social media. Thank you very much.